Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at the pet layer which I made for the mobile game Atlas Empires. I'll be talking about how I made it and lots of tips and tricks for low poly modeling and mobile game modeling. So stick around to see the whole process. I have a whole playlist if you're interested about how I made the models for the game Atlas Empires. The game is available to play at the moment. So follow the links in the description to that game, the playlist and other courses that I offer. So first of all, it started with the concept art that I was sent from Chris Handlauser. He's the lead artist for the game. I might try and grab him for an interview one day if anybody's interested, so comment below if you are. And I could ask him some questions about concept art and his process and perhaps his career. Straight away, I was quite excited about this project because it looked like a lot of fun, but I could see that I was going to have slight issues with the fact that the base needed to change from blue across to green. You can see that it slowly turns green across the different models. The difficulty is that I've got to fit all these textures onto one 2K map, and it's likely that that will be squished down into a 1K map. So all these textures that you see and all the models here are unwrapped onto that one texture. That's important for performance because then you only have one texture call or texture draw as it's known. So in terms of the modeling, I'll show you some of it as a time lapse. It gets a bit repetitive though, but I'll talk through some of the process. To create the base, I used just a normal cube and I sculpted it and then I decimated it. So the sculpting was to give it some variation. It's a nice quick way of doing it. But of course the decimation is to make it low poly. I then deleted any of the bottom faces and I went around tidying up a bit. The decimation isn't particularly clean and you get some really thin triangles which cause problems uh, in the texture painting process. So you have to just watch out for those. So I go around just deleting some by doing the edge slide command double G and then merging the vertices together. I don't always have a set plan of how I model so I sort of think about the shapes and think well I'll probably do this with a cylinder and sometimes I change my mind. So you might see me occasionally deleting things and starting again with that shape um, as I change my mind and figure out the best way to do things. For things like the top of the mushroom that are seen really clearly, I kept that all as one mesh, but things like the stalk of the mushroom, I made that using a mirror modifier, so I only had to texture one corner and therefore model one corner. So that texture is repeated around the stalk four times, which therefore saves texture space, and I've got more space that I can use for the bases. I thought to save a little bit of texture space, I would repeat each base once, that can get a tiny bit confusing when modeling because I always try and create an instance so when I make any changes to one it updates on the other ones. But you have to keep a lot of this in your head about uh, which ones are instance, which ones are new objects and which ones are going to share the same texture space. So it can get a little bit confusing but not too bad. In terms of low poly modeling I have a playlist now with low poly models in it and tips and tricks so check that out, links in the description. And that goes through a few ideas about how you can make your low polys look good. It's mainly focused on low poly scenes in general, not hand painted ones, but the techniques are still the same when you're using it for your hand painted models as well, because you're obviously trying to keep it as low poly as possible for the sake of performance. Lots of people ask me the same question about overlapping geometry. Because I'm using the same model over and over and kind of attaching it to different bits, so like the leaf of the stem of this um, plant thing here, I only want to texture that once and reuse that leaf texture throughout my model. That way I'll be saving a lot of texture space, so I have to overlap the model onto the stalk. That does have very slight implications for performance, but it's minimal compared to if I were to texture that leaf over and over. The texture draws are far more important. So overlapping your meshes is absolutely fine. It doesn't make a lot of difference. That being said, if you have any faces that are hidden, at the end it's worth going in and just looking for those and deleting them because they're not necessary and you don't want to waste performance. So it's a very sort of modular way of modeling this. You make one model, you repeat it, and you uh, duplicate it. You only texture it once, you save a lot of texturing space, but that does have limitations, like you can't have the shadow cast by an object on one of the leaves because that leaf is being repeated and therefore that shadow would appear when there's no object in front of it. So you have to consider those aspects when you're modeling. Variation is probably the key to this sort of low poly style, giving it a very sort of organic feel, moving around your vertices so they are distorted and more sort of natural and organic like I say. 
So for beginners out there, don't be afraid to merge vertices together, use the decimate modifier to make things non-uniform, like I am with this particular mushroom here. You can see that I've made a notch in it, uh, used a very sort of uniform looking cylinder, and then later on we go to the decimate modifier and we kind of ruin it in a sense. The decimate modifier keeps the shape but it uh, distorts it into triangles and lowers the polygon count. And then I go in and I start moving the mesh around, joining verts where I need to, and giving it that organic feel. As this mushroom thing kind of grows, I'm obviously using the same shape that I previously had and then distorting it as if it's slowly growing into this weird flower. A lot of the process is trying to save time so I don't spend too long and don't cost too much money when making these objects. So duplicating objects where possible, keeping things nice and simple, and generally speaking it's more about the texture painting than it is the modeling, but obviously the modeling is vital. Without that, the texture painting is nothing. But with the modeling, the main thing you're looking for is that silhouette. So giving it a good outline that you can draw on and draw the shading and the highlights and things like that. So you can see from those sort of roots on the stalk that they are just attached into the object. They overlap with the stem. And again, that's absolutely fine. And in fact, it's necessary. That way I can repeat each of those stalks and only use a small amount of texture space. And it speeds the process up because I only have to texture them once. So I'll jump ahead a bit and talk a bit about the unwrapping process, which can be quite a headache. If you want to know more about UV unwrapping, then check out my playlist. Links in the description or just search my channel. Now, because I unwrap all the objects at the same time, it's really important that you have all your objects with a scale set to one. So apply the scale to one and make sure it's uniform. So it's one, one, one in the X, Y, and Z. That way, when you unwrap, your UVs won't be different sizes for different objects. You might have a really small object that's got the wrong scale and then takes up lots of UV space. You definitely don't want that. Use a texture grid which you can see me using here, and that tells you the size that's going to come out on your model. So if you've got any really big numbers in there, then you know that you've got an object that's taking up too little space and really small numbers, it's too big a space on your UV map. Once I'm happy that's working, then I just block in some colors, make sure that things aren't uh, with their faces the wrong way and that they're all texturing without a problem. There's no sort of overlapping UVs and there's no sort of anomalies as you go. It's really annoying if you've done some detail and then you find out your UV unwrap hasn't quite worked and you have to kind of sort it all out by baking and oh, it's just a big mess, so don't do that. Make sure you sort it all out before you start painting any detail. That's why it's useful to just block some colors in, make sure everything's working. It also helps you see your shapes a bit easily. I use flat shading and I jump between that and the principled BSDF using the Node Wrangler add-on and just control shift and left click on the different nodes that I want. The flat shading is how it will end up looking in the engine, but the principled BSDF gives me the edges that I need so I can sort of paint the highlights in nice and easily. So you can see me going around this, for example, this flat base here, and just highlighting some of the edges and any bits that stick up. And it helps sometimes to have the principled BSDF so you can see those edges, which you can't see very easily in the flat shading. You can see I'm sort of blocking out that base and you can also see when I paint on one base, it paints on the one next to it. So you can see how I've duplicated each base once. So it slowly goes from blue to green. So I'm using each base twice. And that's so again, I can save on the UV space. If I had to paint every base separately, I don't think I would have had enough detail. And that incidentally is another reason to use a texture grid. By using that grid, you can see if there's any pixelated areas, then you need to increase your texture size or somehow create some more texture space with your UVs. It can get pretty tough then because you've got to find bits that aren't really seen and maybe minimize those UVs that will become pixelated and make bigger areas that are seen really easily, like the tops of the mushrooms or toastals or whatever you call them, you'd maximize that UV space so you've got more texture area for that. So now really comes the fun bit where you start texture painting your objects. And remember that when you're texture painting, you are painting on the highlights and the shadows and the crevices and things. None of that is done by lighting. So it's all a very sort of overly artistic way of doing things. I set myself up with three different brushes. I had a sort of dots brush and a fine dots brush and just a normal brush. And I use the multiply modes and the screen modes quite a lot. And the color dodge mode, I use an awful lot as well for some reason. <laughs> 
So those blend modes take the color that's already there or the value that's already there and modify it in a certain way. Color Dodge is like a super screen and screen is a brush that lightens your textures. But Color Dodge does it in a really cool way that sort of adapts the colors. It's just a really nice brush to use and it gives things a real glow a lot of the time. I wanted to make these toasters look very magical. That's the concept art gave me that sort of feeling anyway. So uh, using the Color Dodge made that sort of slight glow to them all, uh, which really helped, I thought. You start to see also which objects I've repeated and used again. So when I'm painting this one, a couple of uh, sets down, you can see the mushrooms updating there as well because they are just the repeat of these ones. And you can see the beauty of using sets then and modules. Uh, one, it speeds up time, but also it's using that texture space over and over. And you have to be very clever, like I say, the way you use it so it doesn't look too uniform and it's not obviously repeated. Now where the texture painting in Blender falls down a bit is when you're trying to paint in crevices, they sort of overlap. It's, it's screen based and not normals based if I'm, I think I'm right in saying that. So uh, you have to really get the right angle of your screen to make sure you're painting on the right area. And you can see I have to use the smudge tool to blur out any bits that I've sort of overlapped or gone around the corners. The part that took me the longest was certainly the mushrooms themselves. I wanted to really give them a vibrant look. The bases as well took a long time. They take up quite a lot of texture space and a lot of real estate. So you want them to look quite good. But things like the plants I was really quick and rough with and they generally looked all right. So <laughs> I would quite kind of rushed those. I gave them a much lighter color on the very edges of the leaves. That's to mimic subsurface scattering, which you get with all sort of plant life. Well, most things in fact, but more so with organic objects. But things like that can be quite hard to mimic when painting. If you look across to the right hand side where the tools are, you can see I'm using Spots Fine at the moment and that you can see the brush and what it's doing. It's got some really small uh, close together uh, spots and I use that by using the jitter setting on the brush stroke settings. And you can see I'm using the multiply mode there to make the base darker. So it looks like this moss is kind of growing upwards from the grass that's beneath it. The multiply brush is used for the shading parts, but again, I have to be very careful how I shade because I have to be aware that I'm duplicating these objects. So if I move them to a different position, they might not need that shade or warrant that shade in that place. So if I were to shade the base and there was a mushroom sitting on top of a certain area, then the next base didn't have that mushroom, you'd have a big shaded area, which is of no use. So you have to be a bit careful the way you do these things. I stick fairly close with the concept art. In this case, it was quite detailed, it was quite nice. It's not always the case. Chris has a lot of things to do. He's doing the art for everything. So he doesn't have a huge amount of time. So sometimes I'll get very sketchy, sort of rough things where we go back and forth with ideas. This time he had a very specific idea and it was quite nice to sort of follow that along and see it through. I could be a bit more free with this. With the buildings that I've made in the past, I had to make them look kind of similar in style. So I started off with one style and I would have liked to have adapted it as I've gone along because I got slightly better with all this practice. Uh, but with these plants, they're a completely different style so I can go really vibrant and colorful as much as I like and have lots of fun. So you can see here that I'm drawing on the uh, shading and the crevices for this mushroom. And that's what I mean about having a good silhouette, a nice base that you can draw on, and then you draw in the shading and highlights like I'm drawing here. So a really simple shape, but uh, complex painting uh, gives you the vibrancy that you need, the shape and crevices and highlights that you need. So I've sped this up a lot faster now, we're at 4000%. So you can see how long this is taking me. It's quite a long process this, the, the painting process is very laborious and you can see why it's kind of going out of fashion a little bit. But you can be really creative with it so you can get some really nice styles. So I don't think it will ever be completely lost as it were. But lots of people are trying to automate it using things like Substance Painter to get this sort of painterly feel. But you have to use a much higher poly model and usually have to sculpt things. So the process is still time consuming if you want the stylized look, even with sort of automated tools. I think it may have even been around 15 hours, the whole set. This one took a little bit longer than normal because there was a lot of painting to do. Having said that, some of the sets are even bigger than this, so they took a bit longer, but the painting process on this one took considerably longer than other ones. But the modeling process was a little bit faster because there's uh, less items, I suppose, in each of these uh, plant thingy-bajiggies. 
Now you're probably wondering why I've got this sort of floating mushroom top there. That's so I can use the fifth uh, one in the set to paint the sixth one. So I'm trying to use that as a reference, but I don't want it to be right next to the sixth one. It kind of made sense to me to just copy and paste it there so I had this reference because I want them to slowly uh, grow and adapt. So I don't want too big a change from one to the other. So being able to see the previous one is quite important. So in terms of how it's going, working as a freelancer for a big company like Atlas Empires, I call them a big company, I don't really know how big they are, but they've certainly got um, a big game here, <laughs> which is well worth checking out. It's on you know the Play Store and the App Store or whatever they are. <laughs> I've had quite a good go of it myself. I have actually stopped playing it now, but I did play it for quite a while. It was a good fun game because you kind of walk around collecting things and I would go out uh, doing my jog or run and collect items at the same time. It was really good fun but I just got way too busy to keep going with it. And actually, I'm unable to play many games at all at the moment. I occasionally sort of dip into some, but uh, can't really find the time to uh, get into them properly. I really love the role play games where you sort of slowly uh, build up a character and stuff, and they take lots of time, so I can't really uh, spend the time doing that. But I'm really lucky because I get to create art all the time, and that's enough of a release for me in terms of these sort of fantasy worlds that I want to create. It seems the Atlas Empires team are, is pleased with what I'm doing because they keep asking me to do more and it looks like they've got other games around the corner so I'm looking forward to getting involved with those as well. And on that note do let me know if you want to know more about kind of working as a freelancer in the in industry and uh, any questions you might have about that or maybe if you want me to try and get some interviews with people like the lead artist or the CEO um, about the games industry uh, just yeah comment below and I'll see what I can do. Also you might want other bits of information like the concept art and uh, those sort of things and I can always do a video about that and uh, yeah, yeah just just let me know in the comments below so you can see I'm sort of slowly getting towards the end of the painting process I do find it fairly important to go back over things and just sort of smarten them up make sure there's the same sort of vibrancy within all of them those uh, sort of different values and shading and all that sort of thing uh, because you don't want one sort of standing out too much from the others and it's kind of just that sort of finishing up and you can see I've sort of added sort of sprinkly dot type things over some of the leaves and that kind of process. I also added some extra uh, plants in so there was a bit more blue in the early blue stages and I had to find texture space for those but that's not impossible if you use the sort of quick UV unwrap that I used which is a little bit of a naughty cheat. I use the smart UV project sometimes I go through and do a whole unwrap but the smart UV project is quite quick and easy and it doesn't matter too much when you're texture painting. So once again there's the final result and you can see them in their full glory. They should be inserted into the game pretty soon so you can see the models in there if you download and play it. So again let me know your thoughts, comment below with any ideas or questions that you have. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.